Welcome to Thursday's edition of COVID-19. The growing presence of the UK variant here on the local front is further challenging containment efforts amid a host of celebrations, including Parents' Day this coming weekend and Buddha's birthday later this month. Now we start now with the broader pandemic coverage. So let's begin here in Korea, where authorities have recorded 574 new infections, I believe. Yes, Sunny, that is the number, which means we've got more than 100 fewer cases than on Wednesday. Now, although that is a drop to the 500s, we have to factor in that it was Children's Day on Wednesday, which means fewer tests for COVID-19 were conducted. 562 cases were domestic transmissions and 12 were from abroad. And with that, the average number of daily cases in the past week now stands at a little below 600. A little less than 70% of cases this uh, Thursday were detected in the capital region with over 200 in the capital's whole. And uh, these are still popping up at various settings across the nation. Now, as for some of the newest infections, a dozen cases were traced to a major department store in the capital's hall, where as of this Thursday, more than 630 people out of some 3,700 related workers are to be tested. In Gangwon-do province's city of Gangneung, contact tracing continues related to foreign laborers, as at least 57 were confirmed with COVID-19 this month following mass screenings. Down in the southern southeastern city of Gwangju, 13 high school students, southwestern city of Gwangju, I should say, 13 high school students were added to the tally after one student recently was infected. Also, Jeju-do Island saw the highest daily figure in four months with 13 infections on Wednesday linked to a wrestling team. Ulsan is under heightened alarm over rising cases of the UK variant that are raising fears of spreading across the country. And with that, the nation's total number of cases stands at 125,519. And we have 3.56 million people who have now received at least one shot of vaccinations for COVID-19. Now, beginning this Thursday until the 3rd of June, citizens aged 70 to 74 can pre-register for COVID-19 vaccination, uh, either online or over the phone or at nearby community, uh, community service centers, but uh, actual inoculations are slated to begin on the 27th this month for this group. Now, from seniors to young people, Canada became the first country around the world to authorize the Pfizer vaccine for children aged 12 to 15. And also the US FDA is expected to follow suit later this week. Right. So and also on the international front, I understand India is setting new highs. Yes, Sonny, the World Health Organization said that India's cases accounted for almost half of the worldwide uh, infections in the past week, as well as one out of four fatalities. Now, India's crisis also spread to Nepal, which recorded a rise by 137 percent last week, according to the WHO. And as of noon Korea time, India now recorded more than 412,600 cases in just a day, raising the total to 21 million, followed by Brazil at almost 15 million, where not only the Brazilian variant, but also the Indian variant is causing trouble. And the total number of infections around the world stands at 155.8 million. Those are the updates I have for now, but I'll see you back after the briefing in a bit. All right, so thank you for that. Right, the global community is seeking to aid India as it fights a frightening second wave that is overwhelming the country's medical infrastructure and more. I have Yoon Jung-min here in the studio with details on that. Welcome, Jung-min. Hello, Sunny. Right, so do start with the unified global effort to ease India's plight then. Sure, Sunny. So the world is banding together to uh, tackle the growing humanitarian crisis uh, unfolding in India and to show their global solidarity to, uh, in the fight against the pandemic. Um, India's foreign ministry says 40 countries has uh, pledged their support so far. For instance, France has sent medical equipment to back India's COVID-19 response, including eight oxygen generator plants. Germany also sent uh, 120 oxygen ventilators to New Delhi. The UK's aid package includes 495 oxygen concentrators, while the EU has also pledged medical oxygen and drugs to India. The US also delivered well over 500 oxygen concentrators to New Delhi and promised 20 million AstraZeneca vaccine doses. 
helping in India significantly. I spoke to Prime Minister Modi. What he needs most is he needs the material and the parts to be able to have his machines that can make the vaccine work. We're sending him that. We're sending him oxygen. And the Korean government will also be providing oxygen concentrators and COVID-19 test kits to India. Seoul's aid package is now under review and is expected to be worth millions of dollars. Russia, in the meantime, has sent its Sputnik V vaccines. Right. I understand authorities here also working to bring home Korean nationals from India. You're right, Sunny. So, and the government also sent 14 oxygen uh, generators for generators for Korean nationals living in India in case they are needed. And uh, on Tuesday, over as you said, 170 South Korean nationals returned home from India. Most of them tested negative upon arrival, while one person was confirmed positive. On Friday, 211 more Korean nationals will return home from India on a charter flight. They will be subject to mandatory quarantine for seven days at a state-designated isolation facility in light of the threat posed by the Indian variant. Korean nationals and foreigners arriving in the country from India must stay in quarantine at a designated facility for seven days. They must also be tested twice, on the first day of their arrival and once more five days later. They can spend the remainder of their isolation period at home after testing negative both times. The government plans to operate more non-scheduled flights this month for Korean nationals who wish to return home. According to a report, at least 700 residents are still awaiting their flight home. The Korean government has already banned regular flights from India to prevent a possible inflow of the Indian variant. In the meantime, Seoul's foreign ministry says it's keeping a close eye on the situation there and decide whether or not to issue a new travel warning on India. Currently, the ministry has issued a worldwide travel advisory since March last year and has been extending it every month because of the pandemic. I see. Now, before you go, Jong-Win, do tell us a bit about the gathering of top diplomats from the G7 nations that took place earlier this week, I hear. Sure, Sonny. And uh, the focus of the meeting was... Uh, global uh, cooperation on the pandemic, especially on the vaccine front. Uh, top diplomats from around the world gathered this week in London at, at, for the G7 Foreign and Development Ministers meeting. Also invited this year were South Korea, India, South Africa and Brunei, which is representing ASEAN. The G7 Foreign Ministers pledged to work with the pharmaceutical industry to expand the production of affordable COVID-19 vaccines. Take a look. Look, we've got to bring countries together through global cooperation. It's the only way we're going to tackle not just COVID through fair distribution of the vaccine, but also things like climate change. In the meantime, the U.S. Trade Office released a statement on Wednesday that the Biden administration supports the waiver of intellectual property protections for COVID-19 vaccines in the face of a global health crisis and extra, extraordinary circumstances. And securing enough vaccines is a major priority here in Korea, just like many other countries. Seoul's foreign minister earlier said the government was discussing a bilateral vaccine swap program with the U.S., where Korea would borrow vaccines from Washington in case of a shortage, then returns the same amount at a later date. But for now, it's unclear whether the swap deal will actually happen. All right, Jung-Win, as always, thank you very much for that coverage. My pleasure. Right, it's time now for the regular briefing on the COVID-19 situation here in Korea for this Thursday. Now, authorities have been calling on members of the public to refrain from non-essential social gatherings this month in anticipation of greater public movement as people celebrate a host of events this May, including Parents' Day, Teachers' Day and Buddha's birthday. Now, while we wait for the briefing to start, here are a few words related to possible discomforts after COVID-19 vaccination. First, medical experts say it's normal to feel uncomfortable for up to 48 hours post-inoculation. This is reportedly an indication that the vaccine is working. But then again, the absence of such discomfort does not mean your vaccine is not working. Doctors point out immune systems are unique and thus respond in different ways. Now, common side effects include pain at the site of injection, fatigue and headaches. So secondly, with regard to ways to minimize discomfort, here are a few natural remedies. Try applying a cold cloth or pack on the injection site or try gently moving your vaccinated arm to stimulate blood flow to disperse the local area of inflammation. For those suffering from fatigue, get some rest and for fever, drink plenty 
of water. If you need to take a painkiller, most doctors recommend Tylenol as it is the least likely to interfere with your immune response. Thirdly, should your discomfort worsen, be sure to dial 119 for guidance. The briefing is yet to start, so let's now take a look at Korea's social distancing guidelines in place until the 23rd of May. Well, the briefing is about to start. We'll come back to you afterwards. First of all, we have Commissioner Chong Eun Kyung with the explanation on the briefing. <coughs> I am Commissioner Chang Eun Kyung of the KDCA, and let us now begin our regular briefing for May 6th. Starting from today, we are receiving the booking for the vaccine appointment for those aged between 70 and 74, and we believe that the senior citizens, especially for their vaccination, is very important when it comes to the age of over 60, and we believe that the fatality rates, uh, especially among these persons, we believe that uh, there is a very high uh, proportion, meaning uh, that the uh, rate is above 96 percent. And by fatalities, we see uh, that the uh, aged, those aged over the age of 80, uh, they have a very high fatality rate of uh, nearly 18 uh, percent, meaning that every two people out of 10 uh, could also lose, lose their life due to COVID-19. And we also see uh, that the fatality rate is a very also high for those those aged between the 70 and 79, and therefore we believe that it is crucial to receive the vaccination for these senior citizens. And as for the efficacy of the vaccines, we have done some analysis, and especially those above the age of 60, even if they get the first shot, we believe that the efficacy rate is above 86.6% uh, after two weeks of inoculation. And we believe that after the second shot injection, we believe that uh, the efficacy would be even higher than this. On the other hand, as for the people who are uh, over the age of 60, we see uh, that the adverse responses after inoculation is only about 0.1 percent. And as for the uh, severe cases, we see uh, that most of them were related to underlying medical illnesses rather than the vaccine itself. And therefore, we believe that it is very important for uh, the vaccination to be injected uh, among uh, the senior citizens, especially uh, those aged over the age of 60, we believe that it is the very uh, the most effective way to, to protect yourself from the virus and to also protect yourself after even getting infected and re uh, protecting yourself from uh, having a severe uh, symptoms. So we believe that the benefits of the uh, inoculation actually far outweighs any risks of side effects. And as for the booking for the vaccine appointment, you can do so on the uh, website as well as the mobile application. And nationwide, we have about 13,000 designated hospitals uh, that will roll out the vaccines for these group of people. So you can go uh, there in person to make a reservation yourself or even uh, ask your children to do so. And if uh, the online booking is difficult, we also uh, can utilize uh, the call centers and also uh, the uh, local community health centers are also providing uh, these uh, reservation services as well. And as for the eligible recipients in the second quarter, uh, starting from May 10th, those aged between 65 and 69 can also book their uh, vaccine appointment, and the um, 60 to 64 uh, can do so on the 13th of May. And also, we uh, ask you to, to uh, comply with these guidelines, especially for the date of these uh, booking uh, advancement bookings. And we also have four more vaccination centers, and and we have a total of 261 centers here in the country. We, we have in Seoul uh, also two more facility centers uh, opening, and in Muan and Chonju as well. We also have newly uh, established the vaccination centers in order to speed up our inoculation rate. And we are also res uh, responding to the demands, the increase in the demands for uh, the local uh, communities. And here are our updates on the vaccine supply.
supply. And as of yesterday, we also have more than 400,000 doses of the vaccines that have arrived yesterday. And also we have these uh, vaccines. As for these vaccines, we believe uh, that about 810,000 doses. And right now, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccines, we have about 300,000 vaccines uh, doses, and we are also uh, going to utilize them in the near future. And the AstraZeneca vaccine, starting from the 14th of May, we also have uh, more vaccines to come, and they amount to about 7 million by uh, June. And also, uh, Pfizer vaccines will be delivered to country uh, in the uh, um, coming weeks as well on a weekly basis. And here are also our updates on the uh, monthly analysis on the adverse responses after the inoculation. And on the 30th of April, we have seen as of 30th, we have seen that about 0.5% of the inoculation recipients have reported post-inoculation adverse responses. And the rate is on a decline. And on the first week of the inoculation, we had one 1.8%. However, uh, this in decreased to about 0.9% on the ninth week of inoculation rollout. And by age, uh, by gender, that is, we have uh, more women reporting these adverse responses with the proportion uh, standing at 0.6%. And about 2.9% were reported among the age, young age group between the 20 and 30s. And this was the highest among any other age group. And about 0.2%. 2% uh, between the age group of 60s and 70, and also uh, the rate is even lower for those over the age of 70. And by vaccine type, AstraZeneca first dose, we have about 0.8%, and Pfizer vaccines, a first dose, 0.2%, and also 0.3% for Pfizer second dose vaccines. And as for the adverse responses that have been reported, most of them were related to uh, the common and mild symptoms that were common after inoculation, uh, including muscle pain, headache, or fever. And as for the severe cases that we are eyeing, uh, we have about five, over 500 cases uh, that have been reported so far. And we have 73 cases of death and about 180 cases of uh, anaphylaxis that have been reported so far. And as for the severe cases, we are also uh, conducting our continued in-depth analysis being conducted by the Vaccine Damage Inspection Committee and as for the 173 suspected cases of anaphylaxis, uh, the experts have carried out in-depth inspection. And we said that they say that about 30 have been confirmed to be anaphylaxis responses. And we see uh, that a majority of others uh, were uh, not related to uh, these anaphylaxis syndromes. And we believe uh, that these are the outcomes of our um, analysis. And as for the anaphylaxis, they occurred within 30 30 minutes after inoculation, so about 73.7 percent were after uh, between uh, the uh, 30 minutes after the inoculation, and most of them uh, had uh, emergency treatment, so there were no cause, no um, development into uh, fatalities. And as for the anaphylaxis, this occurs uh, within 30 minutes after inoculation. And considering this, we ask you to monitor your conditions after uh, the inoculation uh, by staying at the center for about. 15 to 30 minutes, and also for the next three days when you return home, uh, please monitor your health conditions as well. And as for the details for the uh, Vaccine Damage Inspection Committee, we also have our um, respective employee who will be giving the details. And also looking on the global front of the COVID-19 as well as the vaccination front, here are some details. Uh, starting from 26th of April to uh, the 2nd of May, we have seen uh, that there have been 5.7 million uh, uh, weekly cases, and we believe that this is similar to the previous week. And about 45% uh, of the total cases uh, uh, come from India, with a surge in uh, the proportion of cases stemming from Southeast Asia.
And there are some despective trends uh, for these countries. And we believe uh, that in Israel, they have a very, uh, very high vaccination rate. And in UK and US, which also has a very high uh, vaccination rate uh, at about 40 percent range, they are also seeing a decline of the cases. However, in Germany and France, which have about 20 percent range of the uh, vaccination rates, despite this, uh, the intensive lockdown, they are also seeing continued resurgence of the virus. So looking at these conditions, we ask you to uh, continue to comply with the quarantine measures even after inoculation. And the May is the month of May. We believe that there will be many gatherings and many outings, as well as many mo movement of people as well. As mentioned before, uh, it is very important to protect the lives uh, of the senior citizens over the age of 60, and their proportion of inf infections uh, is about 27% while the fatality rate is very high, ranging at about 95 percent. And marking the month of May, we believe that the best uh, pre present for your senior uh, parents is the vaccination. Uh, so please acknowledge the fact that we are uh, receiving the bookings for the uh, vaccine appointment. So please help uh, your parents to have these uh, bookings in advance. And even before and after the inoculation, we ask you to monitor the health conditions of your parents so that they can receive the inoculation safely. And next, from the Vaccine Damage Inspection Committee team, we have Mr. Kim jun Gun, who is also a professor, uh, and he will be delivering us with the details of the inspection. As for the COVID-19 vaccine, our committee has been carrying out uh, the in-depth analysis, and until the third, uh, 30th, uh, 30th of April, we have carried out 10 sessions of meetings, and we will be uh, going to brief you on about 124 cases that have been reported so far, uh, 67 cases, uh, and as well as some 50 uh, suspected cases of severe symptoms. We will also reveal some uh, details, conclusions, and we we will be detailing uh, these conclusions based on the cases where we did not see correlation between with the vaccines. As for the death, here are the details. Uh, the committee meeting has been carried out for 10 sessions so far. And among them, as for the 67 cases, the average uh, rate was uh, 79, uh, and they all of them had underlying illnesses. And the time uh, that it took uh, until the inoculation to their fatality uh, took about 4.5 days on average. And in two uh, cases, we decided to have an, uh, another round of the inspection after autopsy, uh, while 60 uh, other cases, all of these cases have been uh, the causes of other uh, medical illnesses, and we have concluded uh, ultimately in conclusion uh, that there has been no detailed uh, correlation between the vaccine as well as the fatalities. And as for the fatalities, the major re reasons of these uh, fatalities were regarding the uh, diseases uh, a medical, uh, chronic me medical uh, illnesses, including uh, lung diseases as well as um, stroke and so forth. We believe that out of the 67 cases, about 65% uh, were related to uh, no, were seen to have no correlation with the vaccine. So this was uh, the result of our in-depth analysis. And as for the fatalities, uh, we have seen some cases that have been difficult for us to see uh, the um, see the correlation with the vaccine and the first one was in relation to uh, the person with a Parkinson's disease as well as Alzheimer's and this person was uh, in his or her 80s who were was residing in the um, nursing hospital and on the next day of inoculation uh, this person had difficulties uh, in in terms of a lung um, uh, lung symptoms and also uh, passed away after 10 days uh, in, of inoculation 
inoculation. And uh, after uh, we uh, looked at the uh, screening of the images, we have seen uh, that there were pneumonia symptoms, and we believe uh, that this case uh, was uh, the reason. Uh, the reason for this uh, case was uh, pneumonia symptoms. And the second case was also um, patients with chronic illnesses uh, like Alzheimer's, uh, and this was also a patient in his or her 80s. And also we carried out the MRI uh, screening at the hospitals after showing symptoms. However, uh, this person went through um, uh, vomiting uh, symptoms and also uh, died of the um, died after about eight days after the inoculation. And we see uh, that there were uh, pneumonia symptoms as well. And the, we carried out blood tests, and we see uh, that the number of uh, blood platelets were um, uh, were in the normal range. And we see uh, that the cause of the death was uh, pneumonia as well as the after symptoms of pneumonia. And as for those cases. Uh, of um, severe symptoms, uh, we have seen uh, 57 cases, and average um, Average age was about 62.8, and 87% had underlying medical illnesses. And until they showed symptoms after inoculation, it took about 3.6 days on average. And out of the 57 uh, cases, we see that uh, 53 cases were uh, uh, between uh, because of uh, the other symptoms or other uh, diseases aside from uh, the vaccine. So this was our uh, conclusion. And as for the cases that we have seen uh, that have been deemed difficult to um, see the correlation with the vaccine, here are two cases. The first case uh, being uh, after the inoculation, 10 days after, we see uh, that this person went through um, paralysis, and this was a female in her 90s, and this person went through, uh, also had medical illnesses, um, underlying medical illnesses as well, and also had the um, paralysis on the uh, right side and also had a uh, high blood pressure and diabetes as well. And we also had the screening of the brain MRI, and we see uh, that on the right side of the brain, we saw uh, some uh, brain strokes as well, and we have seen some blo blood uh, vessels closure as well. And this has been um, not reasoned due to uh, acute uh, acute symptoms. However, uh, this were related to the underlying medical illnesses that the patient had, and which also exacerbated and also this led to uh, this person going through severe symptoms. So this was the conclusion that we have reached. And the second case uh, was also a person who had underlying uh, illnesses and a woman in her 90s with high blood pressure and uh, other uh, medical illnesses. And while eating, uh, this person went through uh, difficulties in breathing and uh, this person was uh, directly transported to the ER and went through uh, emergency treatment. And also, we also saw that uh, there were uh, also a lot, uh, a large amount of uh, food uh, which have been um, clustered in the uh, in the tube that has been injected in this person's body. And we believe that this has led to uh, these cases. And as for uh, these cases that have seen the correlation with the vaccine, we see uh, that there has been in one case uh, regarding a man uh, in his um, 20s, and this person has been uh, another person in her uh, female, which has been uh, going under a treatment after seeing some uh, CTV symptoms, and there were these two cases, and also anaphylaxis were reported as well as after inoculation, and also uh, there were uh, some uh, neuronic illnesses as well, and as for these uh, respective cases, we will uh, be carrying out our another round of uh, inspection by accumulating more data going forward. Moreover, as for the anaphylaxis suspected cases, we see that there were 173 suspected cases. We saw that 30 cases have been uh, 
deemed to be uh, anaphylaxis symptoms, and it took about 15 minutes, about 63% uh, of them took only about 6, 15 uh, minutes uh, after uh, the inoculation, and also um, we have seen there were zero cases uh, of death after these anaphylaxis syndromes. Uh, this concludes our briefing on the COVID-19 vaccine damages. Right, that was Thursday's afternoon briefing. So, tell us a bit about what was shared. All right, uh, out of 67 post inoculation fatalities that were reviewed, 65 were said of no direct correlation uh, between the vaccine and the death, but rather due to underlying health conditions. But two need more inspection based on autopsy. And KDCA Tong Eun stressed the importance of seniors getting vaccinated, citing data that said 86% of people who got at least one shot uh, aged. 60 and above, 86% was the efficacy rate, uh, while adverse reactions were only at 0.1% in that age group, while to put that into perspective, 0.5% was the uh, adverse response percentage of total uh, age groups. I see. All right, so uh, thank you for that. My pleasure. Seven. Initially identified in India has been added now as a variant of interest by WHO with a number of countries in the European region seeing the transmission. In our session today, we delve into the growing presence of variants across the globe and explore the possible countermeasures. I have Professor Yu byung wook from Sun Chiang University. Welcome back, Professor Yu. And I also have Dr. Kim Seng Tech from Institute Pasteur Korea. Good to see you again, Dr. Kim. Good afternoon. Now, Professor Yu, as of this past Tuesday, Korea has recorded 632 variant cases, with the UK accounting for the majority. Now, the detection rate for the UK variant over in the city of Ulsan stands at above 60%, while the average for the entire country is 15%. How worried should we be? Well, we have to remind about the previous is the beginning of the COVID. We found that S group first, and the second was the V group. But now, nearly gone, we couldn't find it. In exactly one year before, the beginning of the May, Itaewon, the outbreak, that time we found the GHGR types, families, which means the virus is struggling to survive itself because virus want to survive itself and make the another mutant and the variant. So I believe probably we didn't know how many variants and the mutant now, we just we found some from each countries. That's why we reported. So 60 persons already in Ulsan city and new variants mean it can be the ton of the major types of the variant in Korea Peninsula soon. So we just accept it. Why? Virus lives among the human beings, human beings among the virus. That's why we couldn't avoid 100 percent. I see. Professor, uh, Dr. Kim, that is, the global health body has its eye on seven coronavirus uh, variants of interest and three variants of concern. And these three variants include those from the UK, South Africa and Brazil. What can you tell us about these three variants, including their traits? Well, the, uh, the first one, the UK, I mean, the UK, uh, the variant, I, th I think the uh, some sort of just official name is the B117. And they originally, uh, according to, I think, uh, epidemiological study, the, this, uh, the variant is known to have uh, like a, a 30 to 50 percent more infectious and also 55 percent more deadly than other just uh, uh, variant of coronaviruses. But the good thing is uh, this variant is just still just uh, uh, vulnerable to the, uh, the antibodies and then vaccination, which is good. So we can still just uh, somehow just uh, fend off the, uh, this, uh, the variant of concern. But the next one is uh, South African, uh, the variant. This is also some official names of B1351. Uh, 
And uh, there are, uh, this uh, uh, particular uh, variant is uh, a little bit just worrying because the, uh, one of the, the mutation, this is called, well, the people, sometimes the people call the EEC mutation. This is the uh, name for E484K, just a mutation, which is actually substitution of uh, glutamic acid with the, uh, the lysine at the position uh, 484 amino acid of the, the spike protein. The, the, worrisome, the worrisome is that uh, this uh, um, the variant which contains this mutation seems to be uh, uh, less, uh, actually just uh, the very resistant to the, uh, the current vaccine and then monoclonal antibodies. And so this is the, the concern. And uh, for about other, uh, like uh, the transmissions and or some uh, fatality, we do not know for sure for this uh, particular variant. And the third one is uh, the, Brazil, the Brazilian the, the variant, which is uh, the P1 variant. And the uh, major uh, mutations actually, actually overlap with the, uh, the mutations of uh, South African one. And uh, there are some uh, mutations that are just uh, shared the, among the, these uh, three the, the variants. But I think uh, I want to just uh, the emphasize the, uh, the one particular mutation, EEC, E484K, is uh, the concerning in terms of, uh, because of this, uh, some poor, just maybe just uh, less effective in, in terms of just the vaccination and also monoclonal antibody t the treatment at the moment. Right. Moving on then, Professor Yu, can the double mutant, colloquially, colloquially speaking, of course, the double mutant report in India evade PCR tests? Well, PCR, we are tracing the evidence of the virus itself. This is dead or live one, doesn't matter. Which means the PCR, we are put on E gene or R gene or RDRP gene. They are typical gene, we have it. So we, we do the tracing, the PCR is, we can do the found in the double mutant. The problem is, now is crisis is India, is problem is the people cannot go to any medical services institute. They are being hold in the house, which means they are being suffering without knowing what they have it exactly. So that's why the peoples who are suffering in India, so all the nations should be there supporting the India people can be have it, have it detected by the test. It's a rapid antigen one or PCR, doesn't matter. We have to supply also oxygen supply. We have to. So, all the medical goods are shortage is very is critical in now. We are good, not only for supporting, we are really send some to the India now. I see. Professor Dr. Kim, staying in, in India then, what exactly is meant by the term double mutant? Because I am aware that it's claimed all variants carry mutations, multiple mutations, so that double mutant or triple mutant can be quite misleading. Could you uh, tell us a bit more? Uh, yeah, you are right. Uh, actually, just the double mutant, uh, the name itself, I think it uh, seems to just uh, convey very false impression to the general public because the people just uh, think maybe, well, double mutant, it might be very, very just uh, stronger and uh, more pathogenic. But it is not. I mean, basically, just the uh, most uh, rem just, uh, uh, represented mutation from this uh, double mutant is the one is the EEC mutation that I just told you, the, the E484. I think it's not probably K or Q. And then another one is actually iso the mutation is known from the California, just a variant. So these two mutations are most representative from the, uh, of this, uh, the Indian variant, but uh, the double mutant does not necessarily mean that it is more pathogenic than the other the variants at this moment. I see. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts, Professor Yu, with regard to the double mutant in India? Is it more fatal, more transmissible? I 100% agree the comment from the Dr. King because the double mutant is not the Hollywood movie. Because Hollywood movie, they say double mutant, it can be impressed. When this wording in the, in the media, the people are having more of a look and try to listen more. It can be a more attractive word. But in scientific evidence, we don't have enough evidence to be more contagious, more the fatal. We don't have, a, not yet, not any evidence and data yet. So this is wording it can be the change, like a new variants found in India could be a proper word, in my personal opinion. Right. Dr. Kim, though, generally speaking, do mutations render a virus more dangerous then? I mean, in Hollywood movies, we have mutants and they're much more stronger. Is it the same case with the mutants of could be coronavirus? I don't think so. In general, the viruses somehow just uh, adapt to their own just environment. In this case, our just the human bodies. But then in, in the viewpoint of virus, the, the best strategy for virus is that just multiply more and more and they survive in the host. But if the, uh, the virus is very pathogenic and uh, kills the host, in this case a human, then it's actually just harmful to the virus itself. So the best strategy for the virus is that uh, 
well, just uh, make the uh, host is survive without dying. So which means uh, just the virus itself is attenuated, which means uh, weakened, but then just uh, replicate more and more, which means uh, maybe transmission is more, just more just prevalent, but the, uh, the fatality should just go down. This is the, uh, the way most viruses just uh, go forward. I see. On a bright note then, company officials claim, Dr. Kim, that Pfizer's vaccine may be effective against variants in India. What are your thoughts? I think the, uh, the, the, the BioNTech the CEO uh, seems to just uh, uh, say based on some uh, preliminary data or using some uh, very similar just, uh, variants. And then there seems to be some, uh, some, some uh, basic some evidence by which he can just uh, say it like that. But in the end, I think as far as I know, he said, we, uh, the, he, said he should still just wait for the, some final just uh, the data analysis, whether it is some uh, clinical trials or other some, uh, some lab experiments, whatever. I see, so we'll have to wait and see. Sure. Professor Yu, how do you respond to calls for booster shots? Booster, I 100% agree. From the beginning, I'm, the, um, I'm the telling the, our, our dear audience and watching the Aryan, because COVID-19 did not disappear. This is we're going to live it together, like a H1N1 is like a seasonal flu. Before nine, 2009, we didn't recognize the seasonal flu, not so much. It was 1976's crisis in the U.S. After that, we are for, just forget it. Only some researchers and scientists are having interest about it. But nowadays, we are having interest about COVID-19. But a couple of years later, probably will forget. The people will forget. But probably every year, annual flu vaccination and I hopefully combinated COVID-19 vaccination with invented once per, you know, depends for the both, would be great for a while. But what the Dr. Kim, he commented, very precious comment, virus won't survive. That's why they are going to weaken and change the different phase. But that time we need a booster one to protect a certain group who are very certain group like the more than age and underlying disease persons. Right. Meanwhile, Dr. Kim, what progress has been made on the local treatment front against variants? I hear Celtrion has come up with something that has noted some advances, that is, against the South African variant. Right. That's a very uh, interesting twist because the prior and previously just uh, uh, KDCA and then probably Celtrion actually tested their own just uh, antibody against uh, different just uh, variant, including the B117, this is UK variant, and then the B13, uh, B1351, this is the South African. And then based on the cell culture experiments, they found that uh, their antibody is less, put, less potent against the, uh, this uh, South African strain. But then the, they also just uh, tried the, uh, some animal experiments using the ferret. And then as far as I know, uh, they actually tried uh, some clinical dose of their uh, antibody. And then surprisingly, just in uh, animal experiments, their uh, antibody seems to work, still just to work against the South African uh, 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 variant. And then this is quite, I mean, just uh, unusual because uh, most of the drug development procedure, once we uh, very, uh, succeeded to uh, uh, find the, uh, so many drug candidates in the cell culture experiment, then you move on to the uh, some animal experiment. So if there is uh, any uh, failure in the cell culture experiment, we usually do not pursue some animal experiment. But in this case, cell culture experiments, they failed to just show a very potent antiviral efficacy. But then somehow they just managed to just pursue the animal experiments. But then they, they show that the very good animal uh, efficacy in the animal experiments. But whatever the outcome is, I think this is good. I mean, the antibody is still just effective against the uh, early just uh, uh, virus isolate and also this, uh, well, the uh, UK and the South African variant, which is good. And then, pro but anyway, I think they would just uh, probably just consider some uh, developing some alternative, some uh, the updated version of monoclonal antibodies and probably consider some uh, combination like a cocktail therapy. Right. Hopefully the company will show that where there is a will, there is a way. Okay. Professor Yu, Korea is tightening its entry protocols for overseas arrivals in a bid to stem the spread of variants here in the country. Could you tell us more about these efforts and your thoughts? Yeah, first of all, I mostly welcome these dual regulations because the, not only India, any countries, they're highly they're contagious and the, there are bar some bar their variants is more dominant. That time we can suggest it. First of all, before coming to Korea, they should submit the PCR test negative certified within 72 hours entering Korea. 
And then before they stay only one day in the facility, so isolated. But this time we suggest a seven days facility stay. So first, before coming, test PCR. Just arrive the same day, we do the PCR. And the six days after the arrive, which means the before we leave the institute to the home isolation, we do the test. The, the third one, exactly. And then and conventionally, we do the 13 days before the release, the 14 days quarantine, we do. It's in Korea, we did the three times tests, total four times, which is a very useful to filter any person who came from the high risk of the countries, but they will be great. And also, we will put on, this is kind of funny stories, even though they arrived just a few hours before, these policies changed, because before they came to the, from India to Korea, we suggest just one day, one night, or two days uh, isolation in the institute. But who I don't know who it is, who suggested and they accepted, perfectly changed this regulation. But I'm mostly welcome. All right. So quick changes were made then. Yep. All right, Professor Yu. As always, thank you very much for your thoughts. And Dr. Kim, thank you very much for being here with us today. Right, medical experts say it's better to be safe than sorry. So do seek preemptive testing should you believe you may have been exposed to the virus. Thank you for watching.